Welcome to WMNF on 88.5 FM. I'm Sean Canan. The COVID-19 pandemic drags on and in many places like Florida, it keeps getting worse. Today, we're going to speak to a doctor to answer all sorts of your questions about the coronavirus. And if you have any questions, you can email them to dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. If you do text, please sign your name. Joining us by Zoom right now is Stacy DeLynn, MD. Welcome to WMNF, Stacy. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really glad you could join us. And uh, I'm gonna tell people something about your background so that you wrote about on Instagram so that people know that what your authority is here. You wrote on your Instagram, Instagram account that you are a communicator of COVID-19 information. Your specialty and area of practice is gynecology, reproductive health, and family planning. But during the height of the COVID pandemic in the spring of 2020 in New York City, you were your clinic's associate medical director and you followed the emerging evidence of COVID-19 and communicated that to your staff and to the public. So um, what, why should someone listen to uh, someone whose specialty is reproductive health and gynecology on the expertise of COVID-19? Good question. Um, you know, so I, um, I think that we all as doctors, those of us who were responsible for keeping our, our patients safe and our staff safe had to really get immersed in the um, COVID science and figure out how to survive. You know, I was in New York City during the height of it. And now I'm here in Florida during another serious wave. And so, you know, what I do through my Instagram is try and answer what I know about, um, you know, I have a background in clinical research and um, and medicine, uh, but I also, through my Instagram, like to pull in other experts, we're all just epidemiologists to get their uh, opinion. And I just um, do my best to translate the science that the major medical bodies um, are stating that, you know, is the latest data. And so um, I often say on my Instagram, no one should trust just me, one doctor. And anytime you uh, see one doctor who's got an idea that they're sharing or something that they're selling, they're not the person to look to, but um, I just do my best to help translate the information that the major regulatory bodies and major medical organizations, which is comprised of thousands of scientists and, and hundreds of pieces of research to look at all the available evidence and data to tell us the things that we know that are safe, including things like mask wearing, vaccines, et cetera. And that's something that we'll talk about as the show goes on. How do you know who to trust and where do you get good information and how can you recognize misinformation? All that are things that I hope to talk to speak about during this hour. I just want to remind people that my guest is Stacey Dulin, MD, and she is going to be talking to you this, this hour about answering my questions and probably answering your questions about the COVID-19 pandemic, why there's a surge right now, especially in Florida. One of the first things I wanted to talk about is the biggest news this week so far, which is that yesterday the U.S. Food and Drug Administration gave full appro approval to the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. So explain to people what that means, full approval versus, well, wait a second, I already got the shot. It wasn't fully approved. Um, could, but could this push some people who are vaccine holdouts toward getting a jab? Yeah, well, I certainly hope so. A lot of the polling indicates that people were waiting for this final FDA authorization. The way that you were able to get your um, vaccine before we had full FDA approval was that it was approved under something called emergency use authorization. And in certain you know, public health crises, this, this EUA emergency use authorization does exist um, because the full FDA approval process takes a lot of time. Um, and I know for people who are waiting for it, um, it's just a lot of it's regulatory, a lot of it's paperwork. It takes some, some time to get all of it done. But we now have literally billions of data points around the world for people who have received this vaccine safely. We've seen no major medical health outcomes to this vaccine. And we do see very, very severe health outcomes with COVID infection. Um, it, you know, we've had 630,000 deaths here in the U.S., billions worldwide. Um, and we um, know that the vaccine is safe, effective, and COVID infection for those who survive it. People are often left with long-term debilitating health, uh, health outcomes. And we know for, for the people who are survived but are in hospitals, as we can see here in Florida, the hospitals are, are completely overwhelmed to the point where people needing regular medical care aren't able to access it. And we're starting to see things like um, ventilators and ICUs being have to be rationed because things are so severe. So it was long overdue. I hope that it helps people who wanted that final approval and authorization, it helps them to get the vaccine. And it, it also means that 
it will give a number of you know businesses and organizations the sort of backup they need to require vaccination for things like employment, particularly in the areas of healthcare, the military, et cetera. Our guest is Stacey DeLynn, MD, and she's talking to us this hour about the COVID-19 pandemic and about how you can protect yourself and protect your community. Let me read some of the statistics for Florida from August 13th through 19th. So the most recent week in which the state has provided us data, more than 21,400 positive coronavirus cases a day. That's either at or above the peak from last from January when we, it was really bad. So it's worse now. 150,118 positive cases during that week. Last week we recorded 1,486 deaths. And Florida just became the third state to pass 3 million confirmed positive coronavirus cases. In Florida, more than 42,200 people have died. So why is it so bad in Florida? What's happening right now? And, and how do we improve that? So, you know, I, as I mentioned, I speak with a lot of epidemiologists and other pu public health experts, and no one is surprised uh, that this happened in Florida. The main reason being, um, unfortunately, Governor DeSantis's actions to um, prohibit uh, business establishments from requiring mask use, which we know is enormously protective and helpful. And in the states it's been used, it's helped to keep COVID rates down. Um, Governor DeSantis has also banned uh, businesses from requiring proof of vaccination, which would be a really great way to keep people safe within those establishments. And he's also, you know, been very vocal about having everything open. So we know that there are certain activities that are less safe, things like indoor dining, uh, bars open, not distancing requirements, things like that. And other states that have implemented those, we've seen them help keep rates down. And then while we did in Florida, compared to some other states, have a, um, a decent percentage of our population vaccinated, I think the latest number was, uh, it was over 50%. What primarily that meant was we have a large elderly population in Florida. And so the elderly by and large did get vaccinated, which really helped to keep deaths down. But young people in Florida very overwhelmingly did not get vaccinated. So the combination of the lack of mask wearing the, the low vaccination rates, um, and particularly as the summer weather hits, um, when things get really hot outside and people move point indoors more, it was sort of just the uh, the perfect storm. So this was expected, and uh, not only just those mitigation measures not being there, but the Delta variant, which uh, came to this country and is now the predominant variant across the country, but we know it's highly, highly infectious significantly more so than the original coronavirus that we saw. It's as infectious as chickenpox, if not more so. Um, you know, so uh, it spreads much easier. You need less time to contact. And so it was all these things together were just very, very sadly a tinderbox. Our guest is Stacey Dillon, MD, and we're talking right now on WMNF Tampa. It's 1014 in the morning. My name is Sean Canan, and we're asking, we're answering questions about COVID-19. And Stacy was just talking about the the Delta variant and how much more contagious it is. Yesterday, there was a the beginning of a hearing about masks requiring masks in schools. And during that hearing, which we'll hear more about later, I just want to bring this in because you were talking about the infectiousness of the Delta variant. One of the people who was talking about that to the judge com compared it to compound interest, and in that that uh, the compound interest rate essentially of Delta of the Delta variant is so much higher than the original variants. And so in on an island, if you were stuck on an island and one person with a Delta variant came in over a number of weeks, you would have thousands and thousands of people infected versus only maybe dozens or hundreds of the first, be, just because of how infectious it is. So what what is special about the Delta variant? What can you tell us about its anatomy or about the way it infects people or how what it's going to take to combat it. So one of the things that um, we know is uh, viral load, how much virus a person carries and then can pass on to another person uh, does tend to, it influences how much people get sick and how many other people they can get sick, um, the severity of their symptoms, et cetera. So we know that Delta loads are as much as 1000 times higher uh, than the original coronavirus that we knew. Um, and so, uh, just the this severe viral load that occurs with people is really just really dangerous. And so the good news is that how to um, prevent getting it, those rules haven't changed. So mask wearing in indoor spaces is really important and vaccination. And I know that we read a lot about breakthrough cases 
um, that some people who have been vaccinated are getting the Delta variant. And while that's true, we know for sure that their symptoms are, are dramatically reduced and that the amount of time that they can spread the virus uh, is significantly less. And so, you know, each person who reported, oh yeah, I had the vaccine, but I still got sick. I had cold symptoms for a couple days, you know, it's very possible that that person might have ended up hospitalized or dead. So we know that uh, the vaccines continue to be incredibly effective against the Delta variant. So uh, trying to stay in outdoor spaces as much as possible, wearing masks anytime you're indoor and vaccination are really the keys to preventing spread of the Delta variant. The rules haven't really changed on that. Are we still asking people to kind of keep their distance, doing some physical distancing and some social distancing? Absolutely, that helps. The more people in a crowded space, you know, the more uh, infectious the Delta variant is. So it is, you know, it limits your time inside stores. Um, and, you know, this isn't forever. This variant will start to drop as vaccine rates rise. But I think we need to be very, very cognizant of the enormous strain on healthcare facilities right now. So those of us who live in Florida taking extra caution. And you mentioned earlier that Florida's rate is above 50% of vaccination, and that's partially because of the emphasis of getting so many elderly people vaccinated. But that's still very low in order. We, we heard this number a year ago, I think, and, and uh, we might have a different handle on it now. But we've been hearing that maybe about 70% vaccination or so would be required to reach herd immunity. What can you tell people mm -hmm. about herd immunity and maybe the idea that some people had that that, that could happen um, without a vaccine and then how, how it could happen with a vaccine. Right. So, you, you know, one way that I tell people to understand herd immunity is that um, occasionally there are measles or mumps cases that pop up, but almost all of us got that vaccine when we were kids and it, it lasts pretty well throughout our lives. So just by virtue of all of us having, if there's a couple of those kind of breakthrough cases, we're all protected because the, the, vac the virus doesn't have a place to go very far. And so nobody knows exactly what the number is, so 70, maybe 80%, but you need a really, really high population of everyone vaccinated so that if someone does come down with the virus, the rest of the population around them is, is really well protected. You know, I think that um, uh, a lot of people, as you mentioned, a lot of people have spoken about the fact that I don't need to get vaccinated because I had COVID infection before, but variants is what really changes that equation. So we've seen multiple instances around the world where we had a decent number of the population um, who had previous infection with coronavirus, India, Brazil, uh, and then once a new variant arose, uh, people do not have the protection that they need and get sick again. And so that we know that vaccines are significantly more effective, have much uh, longer lasting immunity against all variants as compared to natural infection. So you know, if someone around you has said, I had the, I had um, an infection before, I'm good, I don't need the vaccine. It's absolutely not true. They absolutely can become infected with one of these new variants. And I'm, you know, to some extent, there's so much spread within the population right now, new variants are arising that we haven't identified yet. And so it's really, really important to get vaccinated to prevent infection. Our guest is Stacey Lynn, D. Lynn, MD, and we're talking about the coronavirus and we're answering questions. I'm going to read an email question or two in just a second, but I, and I also want to correct something. A minute ago, I mentioned a, a percentage of how many Floridians are vaccinated and of the people that are 12 and over, so the people who are eligible to become vaccinated, the correct number is 55%. Still, that's low, um, but it's, it's, a, you know, it's, no, it's a different number than I gave, so I wanted to correct the record. Um, We've been mentioning, let me read an email or two first, if you don't mind. So Greg writes, he uses the hashtag pandemicide and he asks, are Donald Trump, so, and feel free to, if, you, if this is too political, you don't have to answer it, but if you would like to, you can. So he writes, are Donald Trump, Ron DeFascist and Greg Abbott guilty of pandemicide? That's Greg's question. Uh, you know, it's, I, think that, um, I think that what we know is that there are public health responses that can reduce deaths and can reduce hospitalizations. And so I uh, really, really urge everyone to, you know, c connect with their elected officials and talk to them about public health. And I think that um, without public health measures being implemented, more people will get sick, more people will get infected. Um, and, and I will point out that all of those um, people that were mentioned, those governors and the president are vaccinated. Um, so if you are a supporter of those, um, those political officials, then it's really important to know that they themselves got vaccinated 
uh, and so to please do so. Even if it does mean that they get booed when they mention it, did you hear that the other night? I did. Yeah, that's unfortunate. But I think that um, I think that's an important thing to look at. You know, uh, that that um, the people who are in power are in charge. Um, they're also talking to health experts, and they also understand for their own safety how important it is to get vaccinated. And Governor Abbott recently uh, became infected with COVID but he's vaccinated and so he's doing well and he had access to early medical treatment, things like monoclonal antibody, which a lot of people um, won't have access to in the same way that they do. Um, Donald Trump, when he got infected with COVID, had ac access to the absolute best medical care in the world. And right now in the states of Florida and Texas, the hospitals are really, really overwhelmed. So it's very difficult to access healthcare right now. And I should say that as I was about to come on the air, I saw this this uh, crawl on the bottom of the CNN screen that the Kentucky governor has rescinded its school mask mandate after a court blocked the order. So that's a Democratic governor, Andy Bashir in Kentucky, rescinding the school mask mandate. Uh, we'll talk more about mask mandates later, but um, I, I just thought I'd uh, throw that one out there because it's something that we'll be talking about in Florida. The case in Florida about mask mandates will still continue. It's, it's continuing today. In fact, let me play a story about that. This might be a good time, but first I'll introduce our guest again. Stacey D. Lynn is a medical doctor and we're talking about the coronavirus this hour, but um, let's talk about the, what the, the um, trial that's going on. Governor Ron DeSantis's effort to stop school districts from mandating students wearing masks in, is in court this week. A Leon County judge is hearing a lawsuit that's been brought by a dozen parents who want to overturn the governor's mandate ban. Lynn Hatter reports day one of the testimony yesterday focused heavily on the transmissibility of the Delta variant. And this is what we were talking about when we brought up uh, compound interest earlier. So here's a quick story and we'll talk about it in just a second with Stacey Dulin, MD on 88.5 FM. And if it were compound interest, investors would see a lot of money. But in this case, it's exponential growth of a pretty terrifying <laughs> infection. That's University of South Florida epidemiologist Thomas Unash. Governor Ron DeSantis' administration has sought to stop school districts from mandating students wear face masks amid growing concern about kids who were once thought largely immune to the virus now becoming sicker. DeSantis has argued face coverings should be voluntary, and he has repeatedly pointed to a study from Brown University that questions the efficacy of face coverings in schools. But that study, says Nash, is not definitive. Um, they were trying to really disentangle, um, and rather unsuccessfully, in my opinion, and in their opinion, too, uh, they were pretty upfront about the limitations of the study. A whole variety of different factors that could uh, lead to um, you know, the results that they got, which uh, basically showed that the masking really wasn't being, uh, of, the, of the students, wasn't really being effective. Uh, but they did not really take into account uh, the levels of community transmission when they tried to do this. Unash notes the Brown University researchers also couldn't control for classroom density or ventilation, among other issues. A peer review is in progress, but it hasn't been completed. And that peer review is a must for validation and verification of findings. Parents in the lawsuit argue voluntary face mask use is an unacceptable risk to the health of their children, and they want districts to be able to mandate face coverings. Several have, despite the administration's threats of taking away funding and removing local officials from office. Michael Abel, an attorney for the state, says, When it comes to masking in schools, this is hardly a settled issue. There's an ongoing debate over whether masks are more harmful than beneficial to children or to school environments in general. Well, that's a report from Lynn Hatter out of uh, Tallahassee, which is where this trial is going on this week. You're listening to 88.5 FM, WMNF Tampa. It's 1025 in the morning. And my guest is Stacey DeLynn. So the state is arguing there that it's the, it's, we don't know whether masks are harmful or helpful for kids during a deadly pandemic. Well, that was a lawyer arguing that. Uh, I'm going to ask a doctor, Stacey Dillon, what's the answer about masks on kids? So, you know, earlier in the show, I said one of the things I try to do is that I try to um, uh, help people understand how evidence works. 
And so what they mentioned there was that Governor DeSantis was uh, citing a study for his decision that was not peer reviewed, which is a really important process of having other scientists look at your work to make sure that it's sound. Um, so while he's citing that one study, and you might often hear people cite a single study where they read about something, we can look at the organizations that do recommend masking for kids. And so that's the World Health Organization, uh, the CDC, and the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is the major doctor organization that looks at it. There are absolutely no, across multiple studies, multiple bodies of evidence, no risk to having kids wear masks beyond the age of two years old. Uh, it doesn't impact their health negatively in any way. And there are absolutely benefits to preventing the spread of virus. And not only do we know that without masking that viruses spread in schools, but it is, actually, it is absolutely a point for transmission in the community. Unfortunately, kids less than 12 years old can't be vaccinated yet. And so they rely on us to protect them uh, through our vaccination. And, but when they are at schools where masking is not there, um, they come home and they can spread it to family members who are vulnerable. And so I think that within, within all the counties, uh, people see this on their daily lives. They're seeing uh, so many students get sick just within the first couple weeks of school here in Florida. Um, teachers become infected, everyone going into quarantine. And so it's interesting to me that Governor DeSantis is trying to legislate something uh, when he often talks about small government because local districts within Florida are saying that they want to have their kids wear masks to keep their kids safe, to keep each other safe. So I think it's a huge example of overreach that flies in the face of public health. And um, absolutely, masking in kids is safe and it saves lives. And despite Governor DeSantis's one not peer reviewed study, there are mountains of evidence to support this. Our guest is Stacey Dillon. She's a doctor, an MD, and we're talking about the coronavirus. On that subject of kids in masks and school boards requiring or not requiring people to wear masks, either teachers or students, the Pinellas School Board is meeting today to consider mandatory masking. Two weeks ago, the school board decided to keep masks optional among students and staff. According to the Tampa Bay Times, in the first two weeks of classes, Pinellas County reported about 800 cases among students and staff. And that's compared to fewer than 50 over the same period last year. So 16 times more infections this year. And the one, cup, one of the main differences is that masks were required last year, not required so far this year. There's, of course, the Delta variant. There's a lot of other factors. But you, it seems like this is uh, some evidence, at least more evidence, that masking helps prevent the spread of COVID-19, even in kids, even in schools. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, beyond the like thousands of studies that you can cite to support this, it's obvious that people are using common sense within their own communities and seeing what happens. It's a, it's a direct and quick effect. And what's interesting about the Delta variant is that it doesn't tend to have the long lag time of the original coronavirus. You know, sometimes people could be asymptomatic for two weeks. In this case, most people are infectious and symptomatic within a few days just because the viral load is so high. So you are able to very um, shockingly see the direct cause and effect of the prevalence of the Delta variant combined with optional mask wearing. Our guest is Stacy Dillon, MD, and we're talking about the coronavirus variant this this uh, hour. And I'm sorry, the coronavirus Delta variant and other things related to COVID-19 this hour. Florida's positivity rate last week rose to 19.8%. It's the seventh straight weekly increase. This is based on data that the state released, and I'm getting these from the Tampa Bay Times on Sunday. The positivity rate is the highest among 12 to 19 year olds. It's about 25%. And in all of the, can all the, all of the counties around the, the Tampa Bay area, it's pretty high rates. 22% in Hillsborough, 20% in Pinellas, 26% in Pasco, 28% in Polk, 28 in Hernando, and 19% in Manatee County. And there are 16,849 people hospitalized in Florida with COVID-19. Do you, is there any way to tell, are we still on the upswing of this peak or are we reaching the plateau? What, what signs can we look at to see whether, what the answer is to that? There's unfortunately no indication that we've reached a plateau yet, which is really frightening to think about. I mean, those posit those percent positivity rates, I mean, most experts think that that's underreported for one. And number two, you know, anything above about 4% is considered high transmission in which you should be really, really instituting, you know, uh, mitigation measures. And if you look around the world, 
you know, like an example is New Zealand, they had, you know, a small handful of uh, community transmission. And so, you know, they're in complete lockdown and a lot of places around the world are, are doing their best to increase mitigation measures, but we have none. And, you know, just as a personal note, I, I drive past, uh, I often see crowded bars and crowded restaurants. And so, you know, you can tell that uh, some people may be changing their behavior, but unfortunately not enough are. So, um, you know, it's hard to know when the peak will be. We probably haven't reached it yet. It's really terrifying to think about, um, you know, my, my local hospital where I live has started converting its cafeteria into an ICU. Um, as people probably read the news headlines this week, um, Orlando is at risk of not being able to purify its water because they use liquid oxygen and all the oxygen is being used to treat patients at the hospital. It's, it's truly apocalyptic to think about and really, really terrifying. And so um, mitigation me measures are necessary. And unfortunately, with a government who won't do them or enforce them, you know, if there's anybody who's listening as much as you can to uh, just really, really wear masks in indoor settings and get vaccinated and continue distancing. Um, sadly, uh, an effective public health system means that you've got a body helping you make those decisions. And we don't have that right now. So we all sort of need to be our own advocates and safety, I think, at this moment and just being really, really cautious with uh, rates so staggeringly high. Stacey Dillon, MD, is our guest for the hour on WMNF Tampa. My name is Sean Canaan. It's 1032 in the morning, and we're taking your questions. You can email us at dj at wmnf.org. You can also text us at 813-433-0885. Please sign your name. And you brought up the situation in Orlando where, like a lot of water treatment facilities, they use liquid oxygen to purify their water and on Friday, Orlando mentioned, they said to, its, to their customers of Orlando Water, Orlando Utilities, please conserve water. Don't use so much water because we're running low on liquid oxygen because of the coronavirus. They, the hospitals need it. We need it. We're running low. Please conserve water. I saw over the weekend that one of Orlando's neighbors, Winter Park, also issued a similar order. I asked the Tampa Water Department, here's what they said. They said they do use liquid oxygen in their treatment of water, and, but the water treatment plant has been operating on lower than normal inventory levels of liquid oxygen recently. City of Tampa goes on to say, our supplier has continued to deliver a steady supply to us here at the facility. At this time, we are under normal operations. So in Tampa, at least, there's no potential water shortage. They haven't Asked, explicitly asked anyone to conserve water, but it could become a, a, a pandemic multiplier, perhaps, if we run out of fresh water or run low on fresh water because we need liquid oxygen for the hospitals. Um, have you seen, have you, I, I don't know how to ask this, but what, what, what does that say about how dangerous of a situation we're in, Dr. Dillon? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when I read those headlines, I just had to uh, had to take a breath. Like it's it it just indicates the severity um, of you know a, as a doctor who's worked in hospitals for many years, thinking about a patient who needs oxygen and how scary and terrifying that is for a patient. That feeling of not being able to breathe, and then knowing that so many patients need that right now in our state, that we're running out of enough just to maintain our basic utilities. It, it's really, you know, it's genuinely hard to think about. And I think that uh, if you're someone who thinks that maybe uh, this pandemic won't affect you or won't touch you, there are, so, you know, a number of experts who say that if you haven't been vaccinated, that, that Delta will absolutely affect you. It's that infectious, especially in a state like Florida where, you know, things are so severe. And I read recently that if you look at the state as a country that Florida is fourth in the world for infection. So it's, uh, I think, Mississippi, Louisiana, Botswana, and then Florida. Um, and so uh, the severity here is really hard to grasp. And, you know, sometimes it's just numbers or statistics uh, on TV, but as a doctor who's treated, treated patients who um, have needed oxygen, have need to be intubated, are very sick, it's really hard to grasp how many patients need oxygen right now and are having trouble struggling to breathe. Stacey Dillon, MD, is our guest on WMNF Tampa 88.5 FM. It's 1035 in the morning. And I just want to point out that Florida is the only state that updates its coronavirus numbers one time per week. We don't have to mention, you know, don't have to talk about that if you don't want. But I'm going to go on and talk about the vaccines. We 
we mentioned already that the full approval of the Pfizer vaccine might lead people to get, uh, get vaccinated finally. Some people have been waiting for that full approval, but other people are waiting for Novavax. What is Novavax and how is it different from the other vaccines? And um, where, is it, where does it stand in the EU as far as getting approval? And is it likely to get approved in the United States soon? Yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure about where it is in European approval specifically. I know that a certain number of countries around the world are using it. It is a new type of that technology that shows really, really high efficacy against um, against uh, coronavirus infections, including the Delta variant. Um, and so I think people are interested in it for that reason. But I want to take a moment just to point out again that the, the vaccines that we have are highly, highly effective against preventing the worst health outcomes, including hospitalization and death. So, um, you know, it may come on the market here. It's early in the process, but we have um, three really effective vaccines, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. So. I think there's no no uh, reason that we need to wait for Novavax or any new technology. I think as time passes on and we're looking more at the issues of boosters, it might be another one that we have in our arsenal, which is great. But um, if it's available other places in the world, that's great news because um, vaccination around the world is just as important as getting vaccinated here in the US. Uh, variants arise other places in the world where there's low access to vaccination. And we saw a perfect example of that with the rise of Delta in India and uh, because he didn't have access to vaccination there and eventually made its way back here. So uh, we should all be really excited about the fact that Novavax and other vaccines like AstraZeneca um, are available at other places in the world. And you mentioned the three vaccines that we have access to here in the United States are effective. They're also almost perfectly safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there has been no uh, more studied public health intervention in the world. And I, as someone who's done clinical research with medication and devices before, you know, we're able to push things to market with about one one thousandth of the, of the data points that they have. So um, no major adverse health outcomes. One question I get a lot is like, maybe we don't, there's something that we don't know about these vaccines, we'll, we'll learn about them down the road. So the mRNA vaccine technology in particular has been around for probably about 10, 15 years. It's been used in things like Ebola. Um, we know about the technology for a long time. And there is a history of some vaccines having adverse events after um, being administered. Uh, there was a type of flu vaccine that uh, caused a type of paralysis um, about 30 years ago. There was a, a pediatric vaccine for rotavirus that caused intestinal issues. What we do know and understand about vaccines and how the immune system works is any adverse events are really seen within the first couple of weeks of administration and well understood then. When I got my vaccine, the, um, the CDC texted me every week with the VSAFE app to ask you know, if I had any, any adverse events, any, any side effects, anything to report so that they could really investigate it. And we're just not seeing any cases of you know, anything approaching that. And we're now more than a year since the vaccine trial started. The Moderna and Pfizer trials started in uh, June of 2020, and something I've heard you know, people say is like, oh, maybe something will happen a year. We're past a year. Uh, vaccine adverse events don't last that long. The vaccine uh, components themselves, like mRNA, are in your body for about a week before your immune system clears them out, and you're just left with a good immune response should you encounter it again. So that's the reason why the FDA approved it um, and the reason why I continue to advocate for vaccination as safe and effective. Our guest is Stacey Dillon. She's a doctor, and we're talking about the coronavirus. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I mean, we've talked so somewhat during the show about Florida, and it's kind of, I don't know, rogue rules about you can't mandate masks. You can't, there's a lot of things you can't do in Florida that um, where people are being safe, where governments are being safe, you can do them, like mandating masks and um, closing certain businesses at, uh, at certain times. And I spoke with, uh, last week on the show, I spoke with uh, the owner of an independent music venue here in Ybor City, and his name is Tom DeGeorge. And I'd like to get your thoughts on something that he said last week. So I'm gonna play a short clip. And he, as I said, he's the owner of the Crowbar in Tampa's Ybor City. He's also part of the National Independent Venue Association. And he blames decision makers in Florida for the coronavirus Delta surge and also for touring musical acts for refusing to play. And I should say he, he blames not just the, the Delta variant. I mean, obviously that happened somewhere else, but the surge, the, it's worse in Florida 
in part because of decision makers in Florida, but he also blames Florida decision makers for having touring musical acts refusing to play Florida. So here's a little clip of Tom DeGeorge and we'll talk more about it on WMNF Tampa. I have talked to them. I know that they're weighing um, different options, but I think everything is, is a possible threat right now. You know, if, if we're in a state that we can't utilize 100% of the things that are out there to keep people safe um, and you're dealing with artists like I said, that have to travel all over the country. I think we're in big trouble. I mean, we lost the Off With, off with Their Head show. Um, I had Skip Marley scheduled in October. I didn't even get a chance to announce that because it canceled before. And I already have um, several fall and winter dates that they have now hold, held spring dates because they're, they're concerned that if we can't get these cases down um, that, you know, they don't want to come. And I, I had been telling people a year ago, like, hey, listen, when there's a vaccine or there's no vaccine, if we can't get these numbers under control in our state and really take this seriously, we're gonna, we're not gonna get these bands back. And, um, you know, like I said, there's people that will say, hey, well, I've seen plenty of shows. There's gonna be some bands that will come, but there's gonna be, you know, probably 60% of them that will not under these conditions. And in order to get it back, we need to be able to use all of our resources. Well, Tom DeGeorge, before I let you go, is there anything else that you want people to know about independent music venues or about the National Independent Venue Association? All our venues here in the state of Florida, you know, not just Crowbar, all of our venues here in the state of Florida, the Orpheum, the Ritz, uh, Wills, um, big and small, you know, we, we're, we've all suffered a great deal um,